Okay, so you guys ready? Okay. Can I erase? And you guys notice how I write it in front, right? That's the way you're supposed to write it in front. Do like you see. And you know, it's like um, the best way of learning in the beginning is mimic. Mimic what you see, right? That's what you guys need to do. Learn to mimic what you see. Like when you guys, when you're little and you're trying to learn how to talk, right? Initially, you mimic what people said. You copy exactly what they said, right? I used to drive me crazy, you know, my little sister said exactly anything that I said after, right? But she was just trying to learn how to talk. So you know what they mean. First thing, she was learning to talk. That's exactly what we want to do. Okay. Hey, was that productive? Did you learn something? Yeah. Hey, we were on chapter five, right? Yeah, no, maybe. Okay, so when you talk about Dalton, so Dalton had a theory, right? Is it, can we talk about this way? I can't remember. You think we did? So tell me what was, what was wrong with Dalton's theory? Nothing? It was perfect? He was a god? It was wrong. But why was he wrong? Okay, so Dalton basically said that every atom was made up of individual particles called atoms. And atoms were in indivisible. All atoms of one element are identical in every aspect. Atoms of one element are different from atoms of another element. Atoms of one element combine with atoms of another element to form chemical compounds that work together as a unit. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Does it sound right? No? What makes it wrong? Atoms in a microscope? Okay. A really, really good one? Not with a uh, traditional microscope. No. But the TV's in like how microscope is here. Okay? So, but that says what? He didn't say that they're invisible, he says that they're indivisible. Yes. Which means they can't be broken down. Can they be broken down? They can't be broken down? Right. I think the formation of 1,000 
So you think there's something wrong with that? Why is that wrong? Because I think I think you said it made you so little different variances of each other. That's right, they have different variants. I like that term. Okay, so we call those variants what? Isotopes. Okay, so because we know there's an existence of isotopes, we know that all atoms of one element are not one. They get different masses. Okay, which also means that they can be made up of different what? The mass is different. What is changing? Is the number of protons changing? Nope. Because we know that the electron doesn't affect the mass, right? Electrons are so weak, so light, that they do not affect the mass. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. So, What's changing? If the mass is changing, what's changing? You said the protons can't change. We know the protons can't change because the protons define the element. So then what has to be changing? You got no more chance, right? What was it? Neutrons, right? Because we know that what makes up the mass. What do we, we calculate the mass, the mass number, the atomic mass. What do we use? Some of the protons and the neutrons. We know protons can't change, so that means the neutrons. Right? Which also means that are atoms indivisible? Can they be broken down to small components? So what is the atom made up of? Okay, so they can't be broken down to small components. If it's made up of those things, yes, it can, right? So we know that the first one is wrong, right? Because that's not the smallest unit. We know that there's protons, neutrons, and electrons that make up those atoms. And those protons and neutrons and electrons also have things that they're made up of, right? Which I'm gonna talk about in this class. You have to get into my other class to talk about okay? Now, you know that the mass can change within the same atom, because we have carbon 12, we have carbon 13. So we already know that Dalton wasn't quite right. There we go. Okay, so this is just basically illustrating what he said, and we know that this one is incorrect, right? Because they're not all identical. We can have different masses. We know that an atom can be broken down into smaller components, right? And that we also know that that would be incorrect because atoms that are all the same are not going to have the same mass. All the time. But we also know that this part is true, right? Where we can sit there and take whole numbers of the different atoms to form chemicals. We could have CO2, we could have O2, we could have CO2, we could have CO, we could have O2 by itself. You know, so we know that we could sit there and do that. Here's an example of that. So the law of multiple proportions basically says that uh, uh, when we combine two atoms, they can form one compound. Now, different weights of one element combined with the same weights of another element can form uh, simple ratios of whole numbers. So in this case, we have an example where we have carbon monoxide and we have carbon dioxide. So those are two different compounds. They're different ratios of carbon to oxygen. You guys see that? Okay. They're not the same compound, they're going to be made different. So that's why it's important for us to sit there when we write our chemical equation, we make sure that we write the chemical equation right, and we use it as a unit working together, right? Because CO is going to be different than CO2 because of that ratio. We've already talked about the electrons. Electrons are what charge? It's negative. It's negatively charged. Symbol that we use is E negative. The mass of an electron is 1, 1, 1,837, the mass of the nucleus or the proton. So in other words, it's so light compared to the proton that it doesn't matter, right? It's kind of like a speck on, the, on my shoulder, a speck of dust on my shoulder. Is that going to affect my weight? We know that it's negative, 
Now, initially, when we when science was first starting out, there were a lot of scientists that thought that uh, electrons and protons would just kind of mix things together, right? Kind of like a plum pill. Put another image up here. But so, in other words, you're just having plus and minuses randomly, there, right? And that wasn't the case. They actually did an experiment. Uh, Rutherford basically did a scattering experiment. And what he did, he basically put positive particles, shot it through a beam. And so, if it's positive and it comes into a positive, what's going to happen? Positive and positive. Do they attract? It's going to bounce. It's going to repel, right? Uh, if it's negative, then if it's a big negative particle like all grouped together, then it's going to attract you, right? But if they're kind of spaces, it's just going to shoot through it, right? Because it's not going to be enough to hold that positive particle there, but it's not going to be enough to repel that. Okay? So when he did this experiment, he noticed that these positive particles, there were certain parts that they would actually shoot away. But there would be other parts where they would actually go through. And it was very organized how they shot away. So there's organization stuck in this. So what he did, he did basically took a piece of gold foil. Well, when we use that term foil, it just means a very thin, thin layer of metal, right? So we could have aluminum foil, gold foil, tin foil, right? So it could be any type of foil that we want, just a very, very thin piece of metal. And he shot this beam through it. And when he did it, some of them deflected. And when they deflected, it was kind of organized how they deflected, suggesting that you had a very strong mass that was positive, your nucleus, okay? And then other would, would go straight through, right? And that would suggest that there is a negative charge, but it wasn't a fully, like a solid mass of negative charges together. So what they found is they actually started looking at it a little bit more, and they found that the electrons form like this cloud around the nucleus. So we have the nucleus in the center, and we have the electrons from the cloud. And so that's kind of what they're depicting here. And so this electron cloud circles the nucleus, kind of like the way we circle the sun. Not quite the same orbit pattern, we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but the fact that it does circle the nucleus, where you have the nucleus, all your positive charges, all in the nucleus. And your neutrons are there to help stabilize the nucleus. Okay, so then that gives us the nuclear model for the atom. We have a nucleus, and we have electrons circling. Now, those electrons that are circling it, they're not in a big mass, they're spacious. So they're like, there's a lot of open space. Okay, this is basically showing that. So there we have the nucleus. So here we have the nucleus, right? And then this here, that little blue cloud-looking thing, right? That represents the electrons orbiting the nucleus. And so they just occupy that space outside. Okay, so then the nucleus is in the center and it's very compact. It has all your positives and your neutrons in it, your positive charges and your neutrons. Okay, so the protons and the neutrons exist. Now, the thing is, is that if you think about chemistry, chemistry is reliant on what? Chemical reactions rely on what? Why do chemical reactions occur? Again, come on, we said this every week. We say this. Why do we have chemical reactions? Remember the crackhead and the doctor? Oh, yeah. Okay, why do we have chemical reactions? Stability. stability, right? And so, what are we using to get stability? There are three ways that we can maintain stability, that we can get to stability. And they deal with what? What subatomic particle? They deal with electrons. So, what can I do with electrons to get stability? Three things. What was that? I can gain them. I can lose them. Or I can share. So I can gain, lose, or share electrons, right? So if you look at the way the model is set up, does it make sense 
how you can gain, lose, or share electrons where you can't do that with protons? Why do you think it's going to be easier to mess around with electrons than with protons? Okay, they're in a cloud on the outside, right? So the protons and the neutrons are in the center. Uh, would it be easier to take away from the outside than to take from the center? Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a mom or dad, right? And you have your kid. Now you have a bunch of kids, right? If you have a kid that's with you right there, right next to you, and somebody tries to take that kid, what's going to happen? They're going to get punished, right? You're going to fight them, right? Okay? Now, if your kid is all the way across town, are they gonna, is it going to be easier for them to take that kid that's across town or take the kid that's right next to you? Across town. Why? Because they're not supervised. You're not there to hold on to them. They're not tight with you, right? They're way on the outside. So it's a lot easier to sit there and take those electrons that are way on the outside than the ones that are right there next to you, right? So it's going to be easier to pull that, right, rather than trying to get to the center where the mass is or the positive charge. So you're always going to be pulling from that outer shell, right? Does that make sense? Okay, good. One day this is going to work. I'm not going to know what to do with myself if it does. Okay, so protons. Protons were kind of discovered because of Rutherford, because we had that reflection, right? So those alpha particles, alpha particles are always positive, um, and they're they deflected in this case. So that meant that there's that positive charge. So they knew that there's an existence of a positive charge as a result of it. We use the symbol P plus and this P for protons. We also have neutrons. Neutrons are neutral charge. Right? We use N or N out for neutrons. And they were discovered by uh, Chadwick. Uh, so they also know that the neutron and the protons are about the same mass. Right? They're very, very close to the same mass. And that's why we use them to determine the mass of the atom. So we know the isotope. So the symbol that we use for the atomic number is Z, which is the same number as the number of protons. Right? An isotope is just two or more atoms that are the same element that have different masses. Okay? We know that that mass is a result of the number of neutrons, right? The difference in neutrons. So if we determine the mass number, the mass number is going to be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Or we say A is equal to Z plus N. Okay, so we've already talked about the nuclear symbol, right? We know that the mass number is up top. We know at the bottom we have the atomic number. And then we know that we put the charge on the other side because the charge is. And that makes it an odd. Okay? And so you guys are already familiar with this. We've been doing it at this point. We've had three encounters with it already. Okay, so fill out this table.
Okay, so what would be the element symbol for bearing? BA. What about its its mass? Uh, I'm sorry, its atomic mass. Atomic mass. 56. 56. Number of protons. 56. Number of neutrons. So in this case, you want to use, it gives us a mass number here. If it gives us a mass number here, then we're going to use that value. So what did you guys get? You said 82. It's mass number here. 138. Name of the isotope? Okay. Oxygen. Oh. You let me finish, man. Is that 18? Yeah. So it's a nuclear symbol. Okay, what about the next one? Lead. Okay, number of protons. Number of neutrons. Symbol. Okay, and we call it lead what? 
Okay, are there any questions on the ones that we've done so far? No questions? See, much easier than what I gave you earlier. Okay, so let's go ahead and move forward. We have that last one on your packet, right? Then we'll take a break, a short break. Okay. So we've already talked about what we just proven. We know that there's subatomic particles. We know that uh, not all atoms of an element are identical because we have some that are going to be isotopes. So when we talk about the atomic mass, we know that the atomic mass is based upon carbon-12. Okay, uh, we know that uh, the atomic mass is just going to be the average of all of the isotopes that exist in nature. And then that's going to give us what we see on our periodic table, or it's just going to be the isotope, that particular isotope. In this case, we talked about the atomic mass for carbon-12, it would be 12. Okay, so here's an example of three different isotopes of neon. This represents the abundance of each of the isotopes. So uh, neon 20, there's about 90, let's say about 90, 92, 92% 92 abundance of neon 20. So then that means that we have about, between these two, about I'm going to say about uh, two and six percent neon 22. So, and this is just like as I said, a very rough estimate. So it's not going to be exact. So I'm assuming there's about 92 percent here. I said about two percent here, and then I'm assuming about six percent here. Okay, so that's going to represent the full, all three major isotopes of neon. So, neon 20, so if we take 20, times 92%, which is going to be, put it in decimal form, it's going to be, Be zero point what's that? Zero point nine two twenty one is going to be multiplied by zero point zero two. And then that means 22 is going to be multiplied by 0 0.06. Now, since my numbers are going to be a little bit off, we're not going to get quite the average that we get on the periodic table. But if you guys can go ahead and do that math for me, then add up the values that you guys get. So if we look at our table here, isn't that about 92? Yeah. yeah. 
So that's 92%, right? So if we change it to 92% to a decimal form, it's 0.92. So divided by 100. So it'll be 0.92. In this case, this one is about 2%, and this one is about 6%, using that graph. Mm -hmm. And that's a, like an eyeball estimate. What did you guys end up with? 20.14. And if you look at the periodic table, it's 20.18, which means that your heavier ones are probably a little bit more. So you probably have like 90 instead of 92. You probably have 90 and then split the other two. Splitting hairs. 20.14. Yeah. You you add them so it's twenty times this value. Yes. Let me put a yes times. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So the abundance of the isotope in the environment is going to affect what we see in our periodic table, right? So the one that's most abundant, we're going to have a value that's going to be closest to that. So if you notice on the periodic table, it's 20.18, right? It's close to 20. It's closer to 20 than it is to 21, which suggests that 21 is much less in abundancy. You know, we have 2% compared to 92%, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so when you enter it, this is the way you want to enter it. So you're going to enter it 20 times 0.92. Plus twenty one times point zero two plus twenty two times point zero six. And then hit enter or execute or equal. You got it? Okay, so here's an example. The natural distribution of an isotope of boron is 19.9%. And that's boron 10 at a mass of 10.01. 29370 units and 80.1% of boron 11 at a mass of 11.0093055 units. Calculate the mass of boron. So, how would I go about doing that? Yes. So this is this would be the exact weight. So because remember I told you that protons and neutrons weigh approximately one, right? Uh, the reality is, is that they do have slight differences. So a proton is like 0 0.000071, and a neutron is like point one, I'm sorry, one point zero zero six seven. Okay, and so they actually, in this case, they actually calculated what it actually is. So then how would I go about it? Also 
But if you actually take just 10 and one, you're gonna get approximately the same. Be a little off. So if we went ahead and just used 10, and we multiplied it by 19, Point nine nine percent. I mean, point nine percent. And then we do eleven times eighty oops, times point eight. Eight zero one. And that should give us approximately what we're looking for. Just the mass that we get on the periodic table. So if we do that, that's going to be 1.99. Then this one is going to be 0.9. Eight point eight one one, and if we add those together, what do you guys end up with? Point eight. You said eight eight oh one. which is not too far off from what we get on the periodic table. What's on the periodic table? What is the value you have on the periodic table? Yeah. So we're not too far off. If we had added all those little, little bit of numbers, we'd be dead on it, so. Okay. So do you guys see how to do this? Yeah. Right? Yes. Because when we're talking about percentages, right? Percentage just means decimals. It's just been multiplied by 100, right? And so if we have 19.9%, right? We just divide that by 100, that's going to give us point. Yeah. So when we talk about percentage, we're just multiplying that value by 100. Okay, so let's move forward. You guys can do the second part on your own. I'm going to have you do a different Okay. So, if you guys take a look, we have Okay, so we have the, the isotope the potassium. Potassium. Actually, let's do chlorine. So we have two isotopes of chlorine, right? We have uh, isotope 35 or chlorine 35, and we have uh, chlorine 37. So what I'd like you guys to do is uh, calculate, and they give you the percentages on there. I'd like you guys to calculate the atomic mass for chlorine 35 and 37. Calculate the atomic average atomic mass of chlorine. Okay, so if they gave us this. All we have to do is multiply this by this, 
and divide it by 100. This is not give us our decimal. Right? So if we do that, So how many safe dates do we have in this case? Assuming this is an exact number, that is how many safe dates? This one here. Four, and then it has a whole bunch, right? So the multiplication you should end up with how many? Four. Yeah, because that comes back on this one. That one. So then my answer should be 20 states points. That first part? Okay, well, we'll go with your number. What's that? This one here? This one here? Well, no, you have to use it as it is. You could you can leave it as 34, I mean 35. You could do 35, that would be approximately the same number. But if you want it to be exact, right? Use this because this is the, the number that we use the exact weights of protons and neutrons. Give you that. Okay. So why was it fit? So we'll see. We'll see who's closest, right? We'll, we'll, we'll make a little bet. Okay. And then 36.96590. Uh, Times twenty four point two two. So we have four six six. So that's eight point nine five. So. So we just to determine whether we round up, so my answer should be 35.45. What did you end up with? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. This one here? Yeah. I added these two together. Um, okay, so the first answer is, I'm sorry, the second answer is 8.9. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. What did you get? Um, 48. Yeah. So, okay, our table is. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. We'll see you guys back here at 10 05.
there's a lot of people who say spittles, and then the fact that it's able to go through it, then it can be there, or it can be there, or there's positive charges that would just be able to come to the So, we're going to try to hold up those positive charges. How do you get a beam of protons, though? It's not a beam of protons, it's called a lot of protons. How far is at least we have? They're just helium. That mean a lot of Okay, so in this case, it's just this helium. It's just the yeah, just the species. So I guess it's two species. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. And then it's just a uh, program. Yeah. Okay. So that meant that we had something that was positively charged outside of the question. And it was a bit and scattered all the time. So it has to be this. So the positive charge has to be this. Right? And that's going to be the right? And then. Space that probably is less on the Okay. Are you guys ready? We got a minute. So if we talk about the periodic table, you guys will notice that the periodic table is organized, right? Your periodic table, it's organized based upon your atomic number. One, two, three, four, five, and everything like that. In the beginning, it was, right? So Dimitri uh, Mendeve, 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 um, and Lola Meyer, they basically had the periodic table organized by the mass. And if you actually look at your periodic table and you look at the mass of, of cobalt versus nickel, mass of cobalt versus nickel, which one weighs more? Which one weighs more? Cobalt, cobalt right? But cobalt has a smaller atomic number than nickel, right? And so if you look at, if you go through the periodic table, there's a couple of cases where this occurs, right? And so that kind of made things complicated. So then what they did, they went back and they reorganized how they were doing it because we can't sit there and base it upon the atomic masses because we know that the masses are dependent on the number of neutrons, right? And so it didn't make sense. And those neutrons are just basically used for the stabilization of the, the nucleus. So this is our periodic table. This is your periodic table. This is actually a dated version of the periodic table. If you guys take a look, um, you have two sets. You have A, 1A through 1 through 8A. Okay, in terms of your groups. So the one is basically what we use in the US. And so that's that was used before. Today, we really don't use that. We just use the single groups. We don't use the A and the B. Well, the A would always represent the main group and the B would represent the transitional metals and everything else, right? And so 
Uh, when we make reference to that 1A, we're making two main groups, right? And so that's going to be group, group, group one, group two, uh, group three, I mean, group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Okay. Uh, and so they correlate with that. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll list group, let's say 3A slash 13 to let us know what group they're talking about. So if you guys see that, you know they're talking about group 13 on our correct table. So who's in group 13? Four. Four. Aluminum. Gallium. Indium. Gallium. Nahirium. Yeah. What was that? So those those actually belong in that spacing. You guys see that spacing between it says 52 to 71? Yeah. They belong in there. Okay, now if you take a look at your periodic table, the one that you have currently, and this periodic table, you'll notice that there are elements that are on your periodic table that are not on here. You guys see those? Atomic number 113, atomic number 114, atomic number 115, right? So this also helps us understand that chemistry is gonna be dynamic, it's gonna change. The more that we learn, our periodic table is going to change, right? Okay, so things are not fixed. We want to think that they're fixed, but they're not fixed. It's dynamic. Science is always going to be dynamic. We're always going to be learning more. And so we've got to be always be open to learn. Don't get stuck. Okay. Well, it, it's it's weird. Sometimes it takes forever. Like I figure right now, the way things are, uh, because there's such a because of COVID, COVID impacted science quite a bit, right? But it should have impacted it for the positive because we got quick vaccines and everything like that. But right now, the way the the U.S. is, and U.S. is kind of like the uh, we're like the trendsetters in most cases, right? When it comes to science. Um, and the funny thing is that the majority of our scientists are from other places. We're not really good at making homegrown scientists. We're very bad at that. We typically recruit from other countries because other people are more invested in learning than we are. We are invested in making money, right? And so we put money above everything else, right? Um, and so that that's one of the issues that we're having because we've been doing that for a while now. The other thing is is that because of the political atmosphere, that's also impacted science. So I figure these next couple of years, we're gonna say about 10 years, we're not gonna get anything that's gonna be too major, right? We had a couple of major things that have happened. We've had the uh, uh, successful fusion event, uh, fusion reaction, which is ways of making energy. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, it's one of the better ways of making energy. Um, and that's pretty much it for the last couple of years. Okay, recently? Yeah. Oh, that's good. So then that's that's two. And so the thing is, is that in theory, if we support science, right, and support learning, then we can push it to a new level. But often what we get, we get the political atmosphere, because the po politicians control the purse strings of the, of the government. That also affects what they're going to invest in, right? And so we want to make sure that politicians understand how important science is. Otherwise, we get stagnant. And if you think about our public, our public gets stagnant because, you know, how many people are their anti vaxxers right? Most of you guys are going to be nurses and everything like that. You're going to run into nurses that oh, I'm not going to get vaccinated for this. Now, you've been vaccinated for many other things, but you're all of a sudden going to stop getting vaccinated because some schmo says that it makes your balls get bigger or something like that. 
You know, somebody who's never done science their entire life, it probably what happen is that that person has an STD and they don't want to admit it to their wife, you know, or something like that. So, you know, the thing is, is that because of that, because people are so willing to listen to smokes, you know, people who don't have the knowledge and they're so willing, they're so gullible, willing to listen to things. It makes things difficult to move forward, right? And that's that's on a lot of things, a lot of our social issues, a lot of our, you know, uh, and then also people because people are selfish and they're they're selfish and greedy and that they don't want to share with others, right? They also will be barriers. They will cause barriers for the progression of society. It's a big one. How many of you guys were, how many of you guys have siblings? Have you guys, I mean, are you older or younger? Older? You're younger? Older or younger? You're both? Ah, so you're middle. You're, you're the perfect example. A middle child. So, have you ever done anything to your sibling, you know, because you were pissed off at them or that you thought that they got more than you got? Right? Have you ever did anything like that? Yeah. 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 So in society, we have a lot of that happening right now, right? We have a lot of people that are like, well, I don't want you to get ahead of me. So, you know, I'm going to try to do everything in my power to keep you back or try to keep you down, you know? And, uh, and they often will do that. And when they do that, that also impacts our progression in terms of society and in terms of science. And, um, and so, We've got to learn how to play in the sandbox together, right? And recognize that there are inequities, and those inequities need to be fixed. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to move forward the way that we should. And so often when we see issues of uh, racism and stuff like that amplified, that impacts science as well, too. Because you're not, you're not incorporating all the bright minds that are capable, right? Because you assume that only certain people are capable and other people aren't. That's my soapbox for today. So let's keep going. We're almost done with this. So you guys are already familiar with the atomic number. You know what the chemical symbol means, right? And you, you know better to always use that capital and lowercase, right? So you, how many of you guys thought I was talking about carbon and oxygen when I said C, lowercase o? Look at your periodic table. What is capital C, lowercase o? So when it's capital and then little, that one, that's all one. Like that's all yeah, one. That's right. Capital and separate. They're two different elements. Yep. Yeah. And so you want to pay attention to that, right? Thank you for admitting that because most people wouldn't admit it. You know, that is, it is, it's true. That is one of the biggest mistakes. I have a student to the end of the semester. I mean, it was at the very end that it, it dawned on her that, you know, when I was talking about C O, capital C, or okay, so I was talking about cobalt. I wasn't talking about carbon and oxygen. And it, you know, I don't want you guys to be in that same boat. Wait till the very end of the semester to kind of figure that out, right? So it's really important how you write it and then how you look at it because we know capital C or KSO is cobalt. Capital P or uh, capital P or KSO is polonium, right? Compared to capital P, capital O, which is phosphorus and oxygen. So periods, you guys already know this, we've talked about it. Periods are located on the sides, groups are located on the top, right? So groups are, they often called chemical families because they behave similarly. They're like their cousins, right? Do you, do you guys interact with your cousins? You do? You don't. Okay. So, well, if you interact with your cousins, there are certain things about your cousins that are very similar to you, right? They'll be like you, the genetic features, or man, they, they always do the same things that you end up doing, or something like that, because it's in your genes, right? So, in cases of groups, they're going to behave similarly because they're like family, right? So, when they're in reactions, they're often going to behave very similar to each other, okay? 
We've already talked about the main groups. Transitional metals. Transitional metals are going to be uh, for group 3 to 12. We've talked about metals. You guys are able to identify metals in the periodic table. Are you able to identify transitional metals? Transition metals in the periodic table. Can you? So if I say what transitional metal is in group group 12, period six. Mercury. Okay, so we also have non-metals. And you guys take a look at the non-metals. They form like a little staircase on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Our metalloids also form a little bit of a staircase as well. And so metalloids are basically going to have properties of metals and non-metals. So this is the atomic number, the chemical symbol, and the uh, atomic mass for the uh, element that's in the third period and in group 6A slash 16. Okay, what is its uh, atomic number? So period three, group 16, or 6A slash 16. So we're talking about group 16. What was that? The atomic number. 16. 16, okay. And then what is its atomic mass? Okay, and then what is the chemical symbol? And then what is the chemical name? Okay. Uh, is it a metal or not? Um, it's a non-metal. Okay, what about the element that is in period period seven, group six? Okay, what is its atomic number? What is its atomic mass? 269. 269. Okay. Is it a metal, non-metal, metal, or is it a metal? Is it a transition or is it a... Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so these are some of the common elements. So these are the elements that you guys should kind of be able to pick up with no, no major talk, right? So you want to be very familiar with these elements. I'm not gonna say memorize, but you should be able to identify, right? So often, right now you guys, a lot of you guys mistake chlorine and carbon for each other, right? When you say, you want to fix that, so we don't. Okay, so this, these are some of those common elements where they're located. Okay, questions? No questions? Any concerns? Good, so we can move on to chapter 11. We're just going to start off at the very beginning and then we'll, we'll end a little early today. If that's okay with you guys.
Okay, do you guys have all the same pictures that I have? Okay. So electromagnetic radiation is uh, just energy that is going to be in the form of electric and magnetic waves. Okay. Now this energy is going to include gamma rays, X rays, UV, UV light, visible light, infrared light, magnetic waves, and radio waves. So. Basically, anything that's in wave form is going to be basically uh, a form of electromagnetic radiation, except for like really water waves. Right? So. Okay, now when we talk about energy, um, energy is going to be transmitted at the speed of light, volts. Okay, uh, and that's when we did these calculations, it's based upon being in a vacuum, right? And so, but it still gives us approximately what we're going to be working with. Um, when you guys get into physics and, and really deep, deep, deep in physics, they'll start talking to you about some derivations of that. But for our purposes, what we're going to be looking for, we're just always going to use the speed of light is going to be 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared, or you can have 186,000 miles per hour. Okay, so the symbol that we use for the speed of light is C. Okay, and you guys have already been exposed to this equation where C equals lambda nu, where lambda represents the wavelength and nu represents the frequency. Let me write that down. Okay, so this guy here represents, so this is called lambda. This symbol here is called me. And that's the point. And then, that's why I'm fixing it. Oh, you're talking about the first one? This here? Oh, down here. Yeah, and yeah, that's the end new. Okay, now we want to be different and say that it's the velocity. V. So the new, the way it, it's written, it's really hard to see, but it looks something like this. Okay. So it looks sort of like a V, but really it's kind of like a hook. It's a V with a hook. Okay. Now, this basically says that we have the speed of light is equal to lambda times new, right? Or the wavelength times the frequency. Now, wavelength and frequency are going to be inversely proportional with each other. What does that mean? Inversely proportional. Anyone? Anyone? Inversely or indirectly. 
talk about this. Inversely or indirectly. Okay, it's gonna be on the exam. Next exam. This is when one goes up, the other goes down. Okay. When one goes up, the other one goes down. I think the first and direct. Yeah, direct, direct just think they both go up, right? That kind of makes sense. They're, they're direct, right? They both go up. Inversely or indirectly, opposite. Okay. So So this here basically shows you the full magnetic uh, spectrum or electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so you'll notice you have X-rays down here, X-rays down here, gamma rays down here, UV light, uh, infrared light, microwave, radio waves, long, long range radio waves, right? So if you notice, this here represents the wavelength, right? So the wavelength, as we go up, the scale gets bigger, right? But if we look at our frequency, our frequency gets smaller, right? So here we have a smaller wavelength, we have a greater frequency. Here we have a bigger wavelength, we have a smaller frequency, okay? Now, if you guys take a look, this gives you an idea of sizes, right? Because wavelength is distance or size, right? So the size of an atom is gonna fall within the X-ray range. The size of a virus is gonna be slightly between the X-ray and the UV light range. So why do you think we can use UV light to destroy viruses or to destroy cells? Yeah, because they're in the same range or actually they're just a little bit smaller. So those rays are able to sit there, penetrate the virus itself and break up the DNA, causing it to destroy the DNA. And uh, the same thing happens with cells. So like when you go get suntans, right? And they tell you like, if you get too many suntans and everything like that, you can end up with cancer. Well, that's a result of the UV light breaking up your DNA, causing some of your cells to become cancerous. And uh, if you think about it, have you, ever, have you guys heard of gamma rays? Where do you guys hear of gamma rays from? I heard about that, but I don't remember. You don't remember? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they're not going to use it for a CT scan, but gamma rays, if you guys have you heard of the Incredible Hulk? Yeah. Okay. So the Incredible Hulk was technically made because of gamma rays, right? Now, in reality, that wouldn't happen because if you're exposed to large quantities of gamma rays, you're going to die. Right? because it just tears up your DNA because it's so small, it's able to penetrate all of your cells. Right? So the smaller you are, the easier it is to penetrate your cells. So if you sit there and you think about radio waves, radio waves are big, so we don't worry about them affecting our cell or affecting us on the cellular level. Maybe affecting our hearing, but not our, our body on a cellular level because they're not able to penetrate. The waves are too big to enter our cells themselves. And so that's the same thing with some of our other our other uh, components. Microwaves are going to be a little bit different because what microwaves do, they're able to heat the water up inside of us. And so by it's able to heat that water, it's going to affect our cells that way, causing it to blow up as a result. Okay. Questions? Concerns? Catch. Now, the biggest thing that you needed to know this is that these guys are in, we know that uh, frequency and Wavelength are going to be indirectly proportional. So we have C equals lambda nu. Where C is going to be the speed of light, and we know that that's always going to be the same value. It's going to be constant. So if my lambda is going up, that means that what has to happen to my frequency? It has to go down. Okay. Now, there's another equation for energy. We have energy is going to be equal to Planck's constant, which is H times nu, which is frequency. 
Okay, and I'm gonna have to remember it off the top of my head, but I believe it's so where H equals Planck's constant. Okay, so that's going to be equal to six point six two six. Times ten to the negative thirty four. And the units are going to be joules over seconds. Or Jules Hertz. This is H equals six point six. What is that? Six point six two, sorry. Square? No. It's six point six two six times ten to the twenty to the thirty-four. Sorry, my two is kind of funny looking. Let me fix that. Just making fun of my hair right here. I'm gonna go home and cry. Okay. Okay, so then this allows us to convert it to energy or to change the energy. So different frequencies have different energies. So if we look at the different color of visible light, so we have blue light, we have red light, we have green light. So all of those can be broken down. So you guys were able to see those when we did the spectrum, right? So since we're able to sit there and break those down into the different lights, we know that they all represent a different frequency. And so they all have different amount of energy associated with them, okay? And so in this case, if we look at energy versus frequency, as energy goes up, frequency goes up. So things that have a higher frequency is gonna have more energy. So I'm gonna ask you a question. If I have mi uh, microwaves and I have gamma rays, which one is gonna have more energy associated with it? Gamma rays, right? Because they're directly proportional, right? So energy and frequency are directly proportional. Okay, now here's a question. So if energy and frequency are directly proportional, what about energy and wavelength? Are they going to be directly proportional or indirectly proportional or inversely? Indirectly. Indirectly. Yeah. So we know that because frequency is frequency goes up, wavelength go down, right? So that means that energy is going to be the same way. If energy goes up, then wavelength goes down. So things with smaller wavelength are going to have higher energy. Does that make sense? That is going to be on the test. Okay, so when we guys when you guys looked at the spectrum initially with the glasses and you looked at the white light, right? What did you guys see? You saw yeah, you did see energy. That's right. But what did you guys see? Describe it. Like the world, 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 world. Somewhere else. So it's shifted. So we, we're getting the shifting of the energy to the side. Okay. 
But what is it that you actually saw in the glasses? You saw what? You saw the rays from the sun? Okay. And what did it look like? I mean, what did it look like? What colors was it? Was it all was it all together? Was it individual lines or was it when you guys looked at this one? The sun? So it looked like this, right? Like down here? Yeah. Okay. So that's called a continuous spectrum. The fact that you saw the gradients, right? They were moving into each other, right? That's a continuous spectrum. When you guys looked at the different lamps, the different elements, what did you guys see then? Certain translates taken out. Okay, so you guys saw individual lines, right? So that's called a line spectrum, okay? So a line spectrum is where you're able to see individual lines. That basically shows us that there's only a certain amount of energy that's going on, right? The energy at the different colors that we were able to see. Where the gradient spectrum, right, that's visible light. So that's covering that whole spectrum. So you have a lot of frequencies at different that represents each of those different colors. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have continuous and we have wide spectrums. So typically elements are gonna give us line spectrum because they will excite to certain energy levels and that's it. So what you guys are doing, you're exciting that energy to a certain level and then what's being released are photons of light. And so when you see the green light, that green line, that means that that's energy at a certain frequency, at that, the frequency for a green. Or the wavelength for green. Okay, so when we talk about waves, and we kind of talked about this already, right? We literally mean the wavelength is going to be the distance from what we call peak to peak or trough to trough. So this would be a trough to a trough. So it's just going to be that distance. So that's what the wavelength represents, right? The average distance between two waves that are forming, okay? So the frequency are the number of waves that you have. So here we have two waves, right? So here we have one, two, three, four. So we have four waves here, right? So then in this case, this is a frequency of two. In this case, this would be a frequency of four. And then it's gonna be over a unit of time. So we could say seconds or whatever, okay? Does that make sense? So when we look at white light, you guys actually saw that, what is this called again? It's a continuous spectrum, that's right. So you guys actually saw the continuous spectrum, right? And so the little glasses are kind of like the prism to allow us to see that continuous spectrum. So when we did the the charges, the little tubes, right? In that case, you saw a discrete spectrum or a line spectrum. And every element has a unique signature because the number of electrons that they have, they're not gonna be exactly the same. You know? And so that allows us to identify or to fingerprint that particular element. So here's an example. So hydrogen has four lines within the, the uh, visible light spectrum. And so you can see the four lines here. And if you look at mercury, you can clearly distinguish that from mercury. Can you not? And then neon, neon looks nothing at all like mercury or hydrogen. And so you guys should have been able to do that successfully on Monday. Okay, I think we will stop at the board, Adam, and we'll pick this up on, on Wednesday, so the lecture Wednesday.